Good morning, church. <clears throat> uh, it's my privilege to be with you this morning. Um, let me say good morning to those who couldn't be with us this morning and might be watching online. And uh, let me say good morning to those who are worshiping with us in the upper room. Uh, glad that you are, are with us. And this morning we are going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Before we jump in there, let me ask this question. Uh, how many parents or grandparents in the room? Raise your hand. Parents or grand grandparents? Very good. Um, so you know uh, the frustration that comes when you're trying to teach a little one something, right? Like you, and, and there can be both. There's a lot of emotions that come with that. There's good emotion. There can be negative emotion. Um, I think of uh, my daughter. She's, she's almost two. She's not quite two. She's almost two. Uh, she has got an attitude on her. She's got two big brothers. And so sometimes when I want to show her something or teach her something, she has an attitude like, let me do it my way. Then I've got my almost four-year-old who just kind of lives in his own world. So trying to teach him something, he's like, okay, dad. And I'm like, what'd I say? And he says, I don't know. <laughs> Come on, man. You know, then there's big brother, right? He's a firstborn. He's, he's six. And so he wants to do everything the right way. And so we teach him something and he listens and he tries and, and he's wanting to grow and he's wanting to, to do the things that mom and dad are teaching him. And when he, whenever he succeeds, we find great joy. Um, my wife, I love her so much. She can't ride a bicycle. So when our uh, son at five years old was riding the bicycle, she was like, this is the most incredible thing ever. <laughs> like she was just so excited, right? Because we watched these, these little ones mature and, and get older and, and do, start to do things on their own. And it's so much fun as a parent to see that. This morning, we're going to be talking about maturity, but not in the sense of this life, uh, but rather our Christian walk and what it looks like to be mature in our Christian walk. Because you see, just as, as my wife and I, we have children that we want to, to teach and to help grow and, and mature as little people, right? And when they succeed, we find joy. In the same way, we've got a heavenly father who wants to watch us grow and mature in him and in our Christian walk. And when we don't do that, and when we stay as babies, it can be disheartening for him. He wants to see us grow. He wants to see us be the men and women that we can be because of Christ Jesus and what he's done on the cross for us. We are called to be great stewards of the gospel. And it's gonna be hard for us to do that when we will not make the conscious decision to mature in our faith. I know for me, I, I grew up in church and in a godly home, um, but never was really placed in an environment to go really deep in my faith. And it wasn't until, to be quite honest with you, after almost five years of doing ministry that I came to Evergreen and realized I'm still uh, a spiritual baby. And the Lord began to develop me and grow me and mature me in my faith. And I'm so thankful for that. So my prayer for you this morning is that wherever you may be, whether you accepted Christ six weeks ago, six months ago, six years ago, 30 years ago, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart this morning and to say, hey, maybe you're, you are a spiritual baby and it's time to grow up. Hey, maybe you've taken one step of growth and then you got nervous and you stayed there. My prayer is that every one of us would recognize where we are in our spiritual growth and we would allow the Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us into the path of maturity. Let me pray for us and we will jump into our text. Heavenly Father, thank you for your church, thank you for your word. God, I thank you for Paul and his investment into the New Testament church and the way that he was able to lead them. And God, as he writes this letter to the church of Corinth this morning and, and encourages them in the path of maturity, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts as well. Lord, that we would be challenged to not be complacent, to have our salvation secured and then continue to drink out of a bottle, but Lord, that we would be challenged to step up as men and women of Jesus Christ and live the lives that you have called us to be as we walk the path of maturity. Lord, speak to our hearts this morning and be glorified in everything that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's read our text, 1 Corinthians chapter three. We're gonna start off verses one through three. For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not ready yet for it. In fact, you are still not ready because you are still worldly. 
For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? We'll stop there. If you're taking notes, here's our first point. The path of maturity is a choice. Paul is talking to this church and we know that his relationship with the church, he's, he's known as really kind of like the church planter of this church. And so there's been some exchange back and forth with Paul and the church. And, and many believe that Paul, as he's writing this letter, uh, is replying to some questions that the church have asked him to address. Some, some different conflicts and things that they have asked him to address. And so this is not just a random uh, person of God writing a letter to a, a body of believers. This is someone who is invested. This is someone that has a love for them. And so as he is encouraging them to make the choice of maturity, he is doing this out of love. He says, for my, for my part, brothers and sisters, this is a, a term of endearment. So in the same way, Evergreen Church, how much I love you. I've, my, my family has been privileged to be here 10 years. And I count each one of you brothers and sisters. Let me encourage you, just as Paul encourages the church, open your ears and, and your eyes and your heart to what God would say to you this morning to grow in maturity. He says, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. Let's talk about that. When he says people of the flesh here in verse one, in the Greek, this has a special ending, I-N-O-S, I-N-O-S, which is generally used to mean uh, to be made of, okay? So here he's saying, um, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people made of flesh, as babies of Christ. And as he says that, he's saying it in a way like it's not necessarily up to this period in the text, not necessarily a bad thing because we are all made of flesh, right? And when we come into relationship with Jesus Christ, we all start off as spiritual babies. We are all made of flesh and we start off as spiritual babies. Nowhere in scripture are we told that we will ever have made it spiritually. We will never have made it spiritually. We are called to grow and to mature in our faith until the day that we step into heaven into the presence of Jesus. So it is something that we should make the choice to desire and to go after to grow in maturity in Christ Jesus. So just as much as that, uh, we also know that the moment that we accept Jesus Christ, neither are we a mature believer in that moment. And yet, unfortunately, there are people who say the prayer of salvation and they're like, my salvation's secure, so I'm just gonna clock out and sit here and let the world burn down around me and wait for Jesus to come back. And that's not what he's called us to do. He's called us to grow in maturity in so many ways that we're gonna unpack this morning. But just as babies need milk, um, parents give the baby a milk, the, the, their milk, but there's this expectation that at some point, somewhere in the future, we will start giving solid food to the child, right? And then we'll teach the child how to feed oneself and so on. I have this weird habit with, it happened with all of, all three of our children. My wife would just make fun of me every time. I don't know why I do this, but if I'm like feeding them baby food and I got the little spoon and I got the mashed up peas or carrots or whatever it is, and I go over there to feed them, I do this. I, I scoop it out and then I go, I, I, I don't know why. Can anybody relate? All the weirdos in the room. Okay. There's like 10 of us, my people, my people. Okay. Uh, I don't know why I do that. I just like, it just comes out. She's like, close your mouth when you're feeding them. I'm like, okay, like, I can't help it. My mouth just like goes open. And, and, and what I'm doing there is I'm trying to show them what to do. In the same way, we've got people in our, in our, in our influence, in our spiritual walk that will exemplify what it means to be mature in Christ. Look for them. Look for those people that God's put in your path that wants to be an example of what that looks like. But as a parent, I want to teach them uh, how to eat beyond the milk. I want to teach them how to use their spoon. Eventually, they're going to they're gonna start you know, getting snacks on their own, and they're going to start making their food as their own. I was talking to a friend of mine. He's in this room, and he and I both love being dads, and we're very emotional guys. And so we're just like kind of chatting about being dads and stuff. And he said, listen, one time I'm on the elliptical, and uh, my wife was getting ready to take the kids somewhere. And my oldest goes in and he, and he gets out like a Ziploc bag and he starts putting some snacks in there and it's like really like meticulous. And then he like puts it all away and he cleans up after himself and he walks out with this like bag of snacks and he's like, see you dad. And he was like, and I'm just like, see you son. Cause he was so proud that he like got his own snacks together. He'd never seen him do that. So it was such a proud moment as a parent to watch him do that. In the same way, our heavenly father wants to be proud of us as we strive to grow beyond the milk 
that, that is fed to us as baby believers. But yet sometimes, some of us, whether we've been believers a year, two years, 10 years, 40 years, we say that prayer, we come in on Sunday morning, Wednesday night, we sit in the pew, we let the guy on the stage feed us from the bottle, the milk, and then we leave and we don't think about it again and we don't pursue maturity. Church, we are called to pursue maturity and to grow up in our walk with the Lord. In fact, you are still not ready because you are still worldly. Nothing would look more ridiculous than a 40-year-old man drinking from a bottle. Amen? It's just an expectation that adults, uh, that people grow up and they learn how to do this thing. In the same way, God expects us to grow up in the faith and to be mature. How silly, how ridiculous will we look standing before Jesus after 40 years of the label Christian on our life, having never matured in the faith? That would be embarrassing. We don't want that. Paul wants them to grow from milk to something more substantial, but they're not ready. He says, you're not ready for it. In fact, you're not ready because you're still worldly. In the Greek, this, world, this word worldly or fleshly, again, this ends with now I-K-O-S, which means characterized by. We can be made of flesh, as, as verse one points out, but this does not mean that we have to be characterized by our flesh. And you see, this is why things like discipleship and community is so important. As I came to Evergreen as, as the part-time associate youth pastor 10 years ago, I had a couple of years of ministry under my belt and I was like, cool, like I made it. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a real pastor now, right? Man, and it wasn't until I started being surrounded by some incredible men and women of God that I just realized how immature I was. I started meeting with Pastor Nick Dyer and, and doing discipleship together. And he very graciously did not say, hey, you're a baby, go drinking out of the bottle, like he could have. He began to show me what it looks like to grow up in my faith and to mature in my faith. And he was able to do this because he saw these characteristics of my flesh coming out. And he saw that I needed guidance and I needed to be shown what it looks like to mature in my faith. Because externally, we don't want the evidence in our life to, to reflect this world, right? Being controlled by our emotions, chasing after worldly things, that promotion, whatever it may be. But instead, our outward Christian life should be characterized by what? The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, through 24. But the fruit of the Spirit's not a coconut. Not, the Bible doesn't say that, but those who have littles know what I'm talking about. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. So as these people in, in the church of Corinth, they're, they're showing envy and strife and division. I follow this person and I follow this person. That's not the, the external lifestyle of a believer. So he's saying, knock it off. Galatians goes on to say, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You hear that? Maturing in Christ is letting go of worldly passions and desires and now to be characterized not by our flesh, but to be characterized by who we are when God's Holy Spirit lives in and through us. We are called to more. We are called to mature and to love differently than the world. This is a conscious choice to exemplify that you are no longer a part of this world by how you live. Paul here is not just talking to an individual, but when he uses the word you, this is uh, in the Greek, this is a plural usage of the word you. So he's talking about the church as a whole. Together as a whole, we should live as mature Christians. He says, in fact, you are not ready because you are so worldly for since there is envy and strife among you, the church and, uh, sorry, among you, the church, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? We should desire as a whole to know God's word and to know his truth. That's one of the things I love about being a part of Evergreen. In our 101 class, it's happening right now, um, this is where you come into membership, as many of you know. 
Uh, one of the things I love that always comes from that class is when people say, uh, we're joining this church because we finally found a church that teaches truth. And part of me is like, that's sad that there's so many of our churches not doing that. But what I love is as a church, plural, us together, we desire to be in God's word and to know real deep truth. But as a group together, we should also take community seriously and hold each other to that. Families, are Sundays a priority for your family when you come to church? Or is church on Sunday morning simply a reflection of convenience depending on your schedule? Is it a reflection of convenience depending on just how you feel when you get up each day? Convenience compared to your schedule or if your little ones have uh, extracurricular curricular activities. What runs your priorities? Is your priority to be with God's people? Do you take service seriously to serve your church and to serve God's people? When you come to church on Sunday mornings, do you arrive to be served or to serve others? And listen, I've been guilty of that in my past to say, this church has nothing for me, doesn't offer anything for me or whatever it may be. And having that internal focus, how foolish was I? And how foolish are we when we use those words? We are called to serve others and to stop sitting on the sideline. Listen, spiritual gifts are important and they are a part of our lives for a reason. But listen to this. Our willingness to serve our church does not have to be tied solely to our spiritual gift. I'll say that again. Our willingness to serve our church does not have to be tied solely to our spiritual gift, but rather when there is a need. That's what it looks like for us to be a mature church, to serve each other no matter what that looks like. Listen, do you think that Jesus himself was a gifted feet washer when he washed the feet of the disciples? Like, do you think like the disciples were like, man, Jesus, the way you like get in between those toes, like you're so good at this. <laughs> what? That's weird. No, that conversation didn't happen. Jesus wasn't gifted in feet washing. In that moment, with that time with the disciples, he saw an opportunity to serve them in a way that was selfless, in a way that culturally didn't make any sense for him to get down on a knee on that gross ground and to, and to wash their feet after they've been traveling. They don't wear like Nikes and dress shoes like we do. Wear sandals and so their feet are gross. You know who you are. <laughs> And so Jesus gets down there and he washes their feet to simply show humility and service to those he loved. And yet we say, I'm not gonna go serve in that area because it doesn't align with my spiritual gift. My spiritual gift is prayer. Guess what? We are all called to pray. You're not that special, okay? I'm just being honest with you. Listen, our spiritual gifts are great and they should be used in the church. We should like know what they are. Spiritual gift assessments, take them, they're great. But if we tie our service to the church solely to our spiritual gifts, we will miss out on opportunities to show up. That is immaturity. Maturity says there's a need, I'm gonna go even though this freaks me out and I've never done this before. Even though little two-year-olds who pick their nose, I'm, I'm not about that, but I'm showing up because there's a need. Teenagers are gross and talk about weird things, but I'm gonna show up and serve in youth. Whatever it may be. We show up because that's what maturity looks like. Listen, church, this, uh, we, we are just a few months away from August and August is Promotion Sunday. That is when a lot of our ministries kind of kick off their new year. That is when new service commitments happen across our church. I'm gonna tell you right now, there are big needs in every one of our areas because God is doing incredible things here at Evergreen, which is so exciting to be a part of to see God bringing new faces into this room, new people into our doors. In between services, I got a picture from Pastor Scott of our 101. Uh, again, as I said earlier, 101 is where you come to, to become a member. It used to be in what we call the hospitality suite, uh, which is down the hall here. We've moved it upstairs into the new wing, into one of those rooms that's a lot bigger. And he sends us a picture and the room was full. And he says, we already need another new 101 room. I'm like, oh man, that's just, that's praise the Lord. He gets, only him alone gets the glory for that. 
right? But with that sort of incredible growth that God's doing here at Evergreen, we need people to show up. Those families have babies that need to be rocked. They have little ones that need to learn uh, their verses. And, and for a moment, let me step away and not speak as a pastor. Let me speak as a parent who has seen the way this church has loved my little ones. When my almost two-year-old little girl started singing, Jesus loves me, not because mom and dad taught it to her, but because church taught it to her, man, that blesses my heart because that seed is being watered. When my four-year-old is quoting a verse that his teacher taught him in a little lingo, and I don't know half the words he's saying, but I'm like, I think Galatians was in there, like something, right? When my six-year-old's asking mom like deep theological questions while she's trying to work out because out of nowhere, he's thinking of these things that he's learning in Sunday school. He's like, why do they get dunked in the tub? <laughs> so we start having those conversations with them. Yes, it is our job as, as their parents to be the number one disciplers. And we're doing what we feel God is calling us to do to do that. But listen, our, ch our church is incredible to come alongside and plant and, and, and water those seeds in the lives of my children. So as a parent, let me ask you, please consider. Consider fall of 2024, the year that you do something totally different than what you've ever done. Serving in preschool, serving in children, serving in youth serving in those areas that our church needs, not because you're gifted in it, but because you're like, God, use me. And you're showing that maturity. So are we taking church seriously? Are we taking community and service seriously? Are we taking evangelism seriously? This is not just for ministers of the gospel. This is not just for the most radical Christians or just for missionaries. We are called to evangelize anywhere we are. Uh, one of our pastors, Justin McKenzie, uh, he's our missions pastor, one of my best friends. Uh, I love his approach. No matter who he meets and where he meets them, he loves to ask the question, hey, where is your hope? And he just listens. Right now, they're on a mission trip to Brazil. You, if you were here for the countdown, you saw a little update video. They're actually still there. That video was put together by our media team. Shout out to them. Uh, while this team is still there in Brazil doing missions, so keep praying for them. But Justin is so good at just getting those evangelistic conversations going by asking questions like, what is your hope? And he'll listen, and then he'll respond with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are called to, to be mature in all of these areas, but we have to make the choice to walk that path of maturity. Not just that, here's number two, the path to maturity is shared. The path to maturity is shared, verses four through nine. For whenever someone says, I belong to Paul and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not acting like mere humans? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed and each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers, you are God's field, God's building. So here in verse four, we see this division in the community in reference to what maturity looks like. They argue based on who they follow. One says Paul, one says Apollos. Later we see they're arguing about a guy named Cephas as well. I don't know about you, I probably won't follow a guy named Cephas. It's a funny name. That's beside the point. If your name's Cephas, I apologize. You can see me after service. I'll be hiding. Okay, Paul is believed to have founded the church. Apollos believed to have ministered to the church, possibly in a role like a senior pastor or something like that. But we know that these men had great influence in the church. But at the end of the day, Paul's telling them, me, Apollos, Cephas, our homie, great name. Uh, it doesn't matter who it is. None of those things matter because only God brings the growth. The division is not Christ-like. It's behavior that is found when we are living in our outward flesh. Notice that Paul does not say who is Paul and who is Apollos. He says what? Why does he use the word what rather than the word who? Because he's saying what does that person represent? What is that person's influence? What, is, what kind of person is that? And then he answers us. He says, they are servants through whom you believed and each has the role the Lord has given. These men are servants. There is no greater description of a Christian than one who serves. I'll say that again. There is no greater description of a Christian than one who serves. 
And so let me ask you to really fast, take a quick self inventory and answer the question, when was the last time that you totally selflessly served someone else for the sake of Jesus Christ? And if you've got to think about it for a minute, Let's settle that. Let's settle that. Let's correct that so that's not the case. Then he says each has their role. Many of you are those baby Christians sitting around drinking from a bottle rather than getting up and learning to mature and be used by God in this church. From preschool to teaching adults, from helping take out trash after an event to sharing the gospel on a mission field, all of us are called to serve. Then he says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. There's this process to maturity that can be shared amongst believers. It would be amongst Paul and Apollos and those others who invested in the church of Corinth. But listen, in the same way, this is the type of thing that can be shared with us as well. Planted, this can look like someone uh, inviting someone to church, coming in and welcoming a new face, building relationships, sharing the gospel. That's what it looks like to plant those seeds into others' lives. Watered. This can be the act of discipleship, teaching a Sunday school class, or as I shared just earlier, leading our little ones in the preschool or children or youth ministry. We are called to plant and to water. And here's the great news. We are not responsible for the growth that comes out of that. That's good news. And if you're like, wait a minute, like if I'm gonna invest all this time, what do I get out of it? Look, nothing. Nothing but your heavenly father saying, good job, and I'm proud of you. I don't know about you, but that's enough. It's got to be enough. At the end of the day, the growth comes from him, the work of God in our lives. But that's a good thing. You know why? Because that means as long as you're walking in the spirit, and as long as you're showing up in those moments to serve in need because you're doing it out of obedience to God, out of a desire to grow in your maturity, that's why you're there. Here's the good news. You can't mess it up because you're not responsible for the growth. You're just called to show up and be obedient. So that's good news. Hang out with the booger eaters. All right? God will take care of the rest. Uh, Verse eight. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. And each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Just as there should be no vision and maturity, we are called to recognize that we share labor with each other and with Christ Jesus. Our reward is not solely based on our works, but tied directly with our relationship with God. So now, church, ask yourself this question. What is my motivation? When I show up and answer a need, what is my motivation? My prayer before I stand on this stage and present to you is, Lord, get me out of the way. Totally get me out of the way, take away any ill motivation and just allow me to speak the truth so people will come to know you as a personal Lord and Savior. That's my motivation. Why do we desire to grow in maturity though? Is it because you wanna look smart? Is it because you wanna like battle people in spiritual conversation and tell them why they're wrong? Because if that's, if that's your motivation, you can have all the wisdom that you think you have up here. You think God's gonna use you? If that's your motivation, that you want to be the smartest guy in the room, but you're not willing to pick up a chair after an event, but you're not willing to to just ask somebody, can I pray for you? You're not willing to rock a baby after you pass a background check? (laughs) Just saying, I'll throw that in there real quick so everybody knows. But what's our motivation? Why the maturity? Why do we grow in maturity? It's because, man, Wherever God may call you to serve, when you're doing it for him, the joy that comes from that is unmatched. You might think it doesn't sound fun to give up an entire year to go serve in preschool or children or youth or wherever it may be. I don't want to give up an hour away from my spouse. I don't want to just go rock babies. I don't want to go sing uh, songs with little puppets. I don't want to go do these things. That doesn't sound fun. Quit worrying about the fun. The joy that God brings when you are serving out of obedience is unmatched because it's not you doing the work. It's him doing it through you. And maturity happens in the body, yes, but it happens in and through the work of God. And the way the Greek speaks tells us that this is speaking about the church as a whole. 
as he says, for we are God's co-workers, you are God's field, God's burning. These are uh, illustrations of what it looks like to live that out. Which brings us to number three, the path to maturity is founded on Christ. The path to maturity is founded on Christ. So he says here in verse 10, according to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder and another builds on it, but each one is to be careful how he builds on it for no one can lay any other foundation than what has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. They can, this can be Paul speaking to those who have come into the Corinthian church and started teaching a false gospel or an incorrect doctrine. This could be Paul talking to those who are coming in and causing that division, saying, I follow this person, I follow this person, I only serve in this area. I only want to learn from this person. Anything that causes division. He says, don't build on that. Build what is sacred. We live in a culture where, there is this, where there's bad theology everywhere we turn, especially in Tulsa, Oklahoma. There's bad theology everywhere you turn. I'm not saying we're the only good church in town. But it's hard sometimes to find a good one because of what's going on out there. Self-seeking leadership, looking for status, looking to build a brand, looking to have influence at any cost. That's not who we're called to be as the church. And so Paul's like, look, God has allowed me to lay this foundation of Jesus Christ in this church and others are gonna build on it, but be careful on what that looks like. God has called Evergreen to carefully build on what he's done here over the last 25 years. We get to celebrate as a church this December, 25 years. How exciting is that? And as I said earlier, when I arrived to Evergreen, I didn't realize how much of a baby Christian I was until I started to see uh, the people of Evergreen living out a mature walk and, and holding each other to great things. And so God has given us a lot of avenues in which we can do this with the people of Evergreen through the area of Sunday school meeting together on Sunday mornings outside of just the large picture of worship, but getting get together with a little bit of a smaller group, understanding scripture, understanding context, God's word, being in a life group, doing life with each other, having that community, having that accountability to be called to more, to be matured. We have classes like our 201. This is a newer class that we teach discipleship. We teach folks what it looks like to disciple somebody, what it looks like to go find someone that will disciple you. We do this because we believe, we believe discipleship is so important to what God has called us to do here. We do a class called 301. 301 is where you learn spiritual gifts and all the areas of evergreen and how you can serve. We do 401. This is an apologetics class and, and it teaches you about other faiths and it teaches you how to engage in conversation comfortably, confidently, and share the gospel with those who believe something other than uh, what we believe. We've rolled out over the last few years Evergreen Institute. This is a, a program where church members can come and learn, uh, not quite at a seminary level, but more of a deep intellectual level of how to read God's word and understand God's word. We do classes like systematic theology and Old Testament and New Testament, even teaching, things like that. We wanna teach God's people how to be mature and how to grow themselves, not just come and be fed by someone else. I'm excited uh, that God has called us to a new program. We're doing a residency program for those who feel called to ministry. We're gonna have a handful of people join our staff for a year who say, I believe God has called me to vocational ministry. Pastor Michael came to me and he says, listen, I believe God has called us to steward those sorts of callings well, not just to recognize them and then push them out the door and say, good luck, let us know if you need anything, but that we can steward what God's doing in the life of our people as he calls them to vocational ministry. And so they're gonna be able to spend a year with us going through those institute classes, being discipled intentionally by a ministry leader and getting hands-on experience. So church, there's no lack of opportunity to grow spiritually because what God has, has called us to build onto this thing called Evergreen has been incredible. Let's now look at verse 12. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold or silver, Costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So look, we are called for our maturity to build things that are solid and things that are pure and things that are 
are going to last that day that we step into glory and meet Jesus face to face. Because all that comes with us are, is what we have done for him. So in your life, what does it look like for you to dedicate your life in all things to bring God honor and glory and to make him know? In any sort of work that you do, what is your motivation? Is it a worldly motivation or is it a spiritual motivation? Your desire for knowledge, is it, a, is it to pride yourself up? To look like the smartest person in the room? Or is it, Lord, I wanna know you deeper. I wanna be in your word. I, know, I wanna know what this means, how to apply it, how to share it with others. Our reputation, our priorities. Because listen, we will give an account on how we've stewarded the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lives. So my question then, in accordance to what Paul says here, is how will your life stand against the fire that purifies our life of anything not of Jesus and making him known? Because again, if you say the prayer of salvation and then you slip in and slip out every week, just drink it from the bottle and then you stand before Jesus, everything else that you did is gonna go away. And what are you gonna be standing there showing Jesus? Just the life of I accepted you and I waited, waited around? As a father, if I'm investing in, in my child and I'm doing these things and I'm, I'm loving him and I'm leading him and he does nothing with that, that will break my heart. God has given us the free gift of salvation. We have a choice to respond to that gift and accept that gift and say, yes, I wanna make you my Lord and Savior. But then from that, we must then make the decision to grow in maturity. Your salvation is secure, but recognize that we are called to more. It says, if anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved but only as through fire. So we know that Paul is writing here to all of the believers. And he's saying, if you've accepted salvation, you're good, but you are called to more. So be more, be what God's called you to be. Let's look at the next few verses. Don't, verse 16, don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and that is what you are. So again, recognize that this is him speaking plurally, uh, not singularly, okay? Not just as a person. Yes, there are verses that tells us that our body is the temple and the Holy Spirit dwells within us. That is not the context of this. This is talking about the entire church. So he says, don't you, don't you yourselves know that you, the entire church, are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you, the entire church. If anyone destroys God's temple, the entire church, God will destroy him for, any, for, for God's temple is holy, and that is what you, the entire church, are. If there's anyone trying to cause division or teach a false gospel, God will intervene. And I don't know about you, but I would not want to stand before God after actively trying to cause division in his church. God's word speaks about the church. Uh, one, one of the phrases that is used is as the bride of Christ. I myself have a bride, Ashley, high school sweethearts, just celebrated 12 years, three kids. She's special. Amen? I'm watching. Who's saying it? No, I'm just kidding. No, she's special to me. I love my bride so much, so much. But man, you mess with my bride? Boy, we're talking. And it's not going to be comfortable, right? I'm going to defend my bride. I'm going to have her back. I'm called to protect her. I'm called to lead her. If you've got a problem with her, you got a problem with me and that's not, it's, it's gonna be weird, right? And yet sometimes, for some reason, we, we seem to think about the church separate from God. Like we can have this relationship with God and me and God are good and we have an understanding, but his church, I don't want anything to do with that. And then we start talking negatively about his church. We cause division about the church. They're just a bunch of hypocrites. They don't do this and they don't do that. They don't serve me well and they're doing all these things. You don't think God takes offense to you talking about his bride that way? We should not do that. We are called to be the temple. We are called to be together and not cause division. So I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the one messing with the bride of Christ. He says, for God's temple is holy and that is what you are. So as holy people, let us strive for maturity. Verse 18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone amongst you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool so that he can become wise. 
For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, since it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the reasonings of the wise are futile. Real wisdom only comes through a relationship with, with Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit within us. We are not wise by any standard outside of Christ. We may, not, we may have knowledge, we may know things, but knowledge is not wisdom. Wisdom is having knowledge and knowing how to apply it, how to live a life for Christ. Listen, to those whom Paul is writing, um, it, was, it was a big deal to be like a scholar, to know things. It was a big deal for them to know like Greek philosophy and, and all those things. And so they would pride themselves off of that knowledge. They would try to have reputations based off their knowledge. And Paul saying, what are you doing? Knock it off. That's not what, what wisdom is. Matter of fact, that's foolishness because any sort of knowledge that is not of God and that is not used for God is foolishness. It's not real wisdom. So let me ask you, what kind of things are, are you bringing into your mind and into your spirit? What sort of things are you chasing after to be knowledgeable about? Now, listen, I love fantasy football. It's a real bummer time of year for me right now because there's no football going on and the Thunder are no longer in the NBA playoffs. So I'm, I'm not having a whole lot of fun with my hobby because there's nothing for me to do. The XFL is not a good example of football. Um, but I love football so much and I love fantasy football so much. And it's so funny because like I'll sit with a friend or with my brother and we'll talk fantasy football and we're talking about like all these names and the teams and the positions and they were traded here and this is how many years are left on their contract and this is how old they are and all this stuff. And my wife will go, where do you put all that knowledge? And I'm talking to a, a math professor. So I said, the same place you put your numbers. I don't know. Like you just, we find places to put that knowledge, right? But listen, those things in and of themselves aren't necessarily bad. But when like, that's the stuff that we're chasing after, I want to be known as the smartest guy in fantasy football. I want to be known as the most successful person in my business. I want to be known as the, the deepest theological thinker. So people will think I'm the smartest guy in the room. What is our motivation? Ultimately, we should desire to, yes, be knowledgeable of Christ, but to live it out in our lives and to bring him honor and glory because that is where real wisdom lies. This is, what, this is what shows that we are growing and maturing spiritually. Let's wrap up here, verse 21 through 23. So let no one boast in human leaders for everyone, everything is yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, everything is yours and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. Here's what he's saying. is God saying, look, I've given you resources and people and leaders and influence and all of these things for you to grow in that knowledge. That's fine. Grow by Paul and by Cephas and by Apollos. I've given you these things to grow. These things inherently are not bad in and of themselves. Everything is yours. But you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. So when we are seeking after that knowledge and that wisdom, but we're doing so by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, then we're in the good place. We're in the place of growing in our maturity. We can be open to growing in our maturity in so many ways as long as we keep Jesus as our foundation. And I love that last, that last line of our text. You belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. So church, let me ask you this question. Do you wake up every morning with the confidence knowing you belong to Christ? And whatever you do each day, today I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna go to work. I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna be the best parent. I'm gonna get up and fill in the blank. I'm gonna do so as someone who belongs to Christ. Does your confidence to live your life every day as a mature believer come in your walk with Christ? Are you spending time in his word? Are you spending time in prayer? Are you sharing in the life of the community? Are you making godly things priority in your life? Because when you are, you can be confident that you're walking a mature walk. We belong to Christ. Christ belongs to God. So you may be listening to this lesson and my prayer is that if any of us in here needs to be convicted, you're not convicted by my words, you're convicted simply and only by the Holy Spirit. 
And my suspicion is that there's two kinds of people in this room. There's one that says, you know what? I've been drinking from the bottle for way too long. The milk. That's what we're talking about here. I'm an immature believer. I prayed the prayer of salvation a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 40 years ago. And I've not made the conscious decision to be a mature believer. Maybe that's you. And this morning you're like, okay, God, I'm done. I'm done drinking milk from the bottle. I want solid food and I want to grow in my maturity. I invite you, come forward and lay that at the altar. Lay that at the feet of Jesus and ask God to bring men and women into your life that would hold you accountable to that and, and, and help you learn what that looks like to live that out every day. But I, I, I believe that there's another person in this room. Someone who thinks that they said a prayer many years ago and they've never figured out how to even become mature. And so you're listening to a lesson like this and you're like, I don't, I don't know what any of that means. All I know is I said a prayer when I was younger and my life hasn't really changed much at all. And I don't know why. Maybe you're like me, where for the longest time, I thought being saved was just saying a prayer of God, don't let me go to hell. But you see what salvation is, is us saying a prayer that says, Jesus, I believe what you did on the cross. I believe you died for my sin. And I wanna make you my savior, which means because of what he did on the cross, we no longer have to spend eternity separated from him, but also my Lord. We miss that part sometimes. We're all good for Jesus to become our get out of hell free card. But the idea to actually surrender our entire life to him, some of us haven't actually done that. Although we're living this life that we're good because we said a prayer when we were six. We just said something because a, a pastor scared me when he talked about hell. And so if that's you and you're like, man, I want to grow in my maturity. But I've I don't think I've actually ever surrendered my life in its entirety to God. My encouragement is that you would do that this morning. You've got to surrender everything to start this path to maturity because the path of maturity is only founded in Christ Jesus. So if you don't have that relationship, if you've not given him your life, how's that going to happen? So as we worship together here in just a moment, we'll have a few of our pastors up front. Just ask God, Lord, are you calling me to more? Are you calling me in a way that, that shows um, that I need, to, I need to serve in a way that's uncomfortable? Are you calling me to join a class to, to, to be challenged in ways that I've never been challenged? Are you calling me to disciple someone, to rock a baby, whatever it is? Come forward and just share that with somebody. Ask them to pray over you. As we prepare for promotion Sunday in August, don't make a decision today. Say, God, where would you have me serve my church? Where would you have me meet a need? Even if it's inconvenient for me, it doesn't matter. I want to serve you and be obedient. Wherever you are, whether you just need to step up or step out and give your life to Christ. Maybe you don't have a church home and you'd like to make Evergreen your church home. As I said earlier, we've got a class that we do called 101. Just come forward and talk to one of our pastors. We'll give you information about that. We'd love for you to come into membership here. Maybe you need to, to come forward and just say, hey, I've, I've given my life to Christ, but I've never been baptized. I wanna stand before the church and I wanna declare my commitment to giving my life to Christ. Just come talk to a pastor. We'll get that taken care of. Let me pray for us and the altar will be open. Heavenly Father, thank you for your work in our lives. Thank you for this word you've given us this morning, God. And I pray that we are all challenged to grow in our maturity. Lord, I pray for each individual in here from the most mature to the least mature, Lord, call us to more because more is not from our own means. More is us living in and through you and allowing your work and your power to be displayed through us. God, right now, I pray that there are walls being broken down. I pray right now, Lord, that you would give that person in this room boldness to say, I need to surrender my life. God, I pray that you would call each of us to serve you obediently, regardless of what it looks like, that you would have your way in the people of Evergreen. Lord, move in your people. I love you and I pray this in your name. Amen. Stand and let's worship.